Okay, everybody, let's return our attention to our study of Ulrich Zwingli. And we're going to pick up where we left off with this beautiful photo of the Rhine River and this very important quote from Ulrich Zwingli. For God's sake, do not put yourself at odds with the Word of God, for truly it will persist as surely as the Rhine follows its course. One can perhaps dam it up for a while, but it is impossible to stop it. And so we see that the theme of the first disputation is the affirmation of Scripture as the basis of authority for church life. You'll want to remember that. Well, let's uh, move on to the next step in the Zurich Reformation, which took place in October of that very same year, 1523. The city council uh, called another disputation in which uh, Zwingli and his followers presented their goals for the Reformation. Now, the topics planned on the agenda were the use of images, the mass, and purgatory. Now, quick agreement was reached to reject the use of images. We've talked before about the use of images in churches, and often they were viewed as idolatrous. And so uh, the decision was made to remove images from the churches, particularly the crucifixes uh, that showed Christ still on the cross uh, as a representation of Gregory the First's idea uh, of the perpetual sacrifice of Christ. Purgatory was never discussed. It was an issue that was largely rejected by the reformers, but instead the remainder of the discussion was spent on replacing the formal liturgical Latin Mass with a simple Lord's Supper. And so we see that the theme of the second disputation is the Lord's Supper. Now, the magistrates delayed the implementation of Zwingli's plan to uh, convert the Mass to a simple evangelical uh, Lord's Supper. Uh, the magistrates were not prepared to give up the Mass, which up until now had been the central event in the worship. It was a prominent part of the understanding of salvation through sacramentalism. Now, Zwingli's followers were present, and they insisted on immediate action. Zwingli, however, decided that he would side with the magistrates and postpone the implementation of his own plan. Now, often young pastors are eager to make changes, especially those that they feel are biblical, spiritual, inappropriate for the church. But often the people of the church resist change. And so the wise pastor knows how to bring a congregation along slowly, carefully, uh, basing all decisions on uh, the teaching of Scripture. However, Zwingli's young followers were very impatient, and so this led to a break between uh, these young followers, Zwingli students, uh, against Zwingli and the magistrates. And so no action was taken in October of 1523.
On Christmas Day, just a couple of months later, Zwingli did not conduct the simple Lord's Supper as he had previously planned, and so many of his student followers broke with Zwingli. Well, let's talk about his student followers because they are going to lead the next phase of the Reformation. In 1519, Zwingli began attracting students. Uh, about a dozen or more students uh, surrounded him, eager to learn Greek and Hebrew, uh, eager to study the Bible with this great Bible scholar. We're going to highlight three of these students, uh, these students known as the Swiss Brethren, and the first was Conrad Grable, who was the son of a city councilman, therefore highly placed in the public life of the city. Felix Mons was another of the illegitimate children of a priest. And then George Blaurock was a former priest who had renounced his clerical vows. He had become a layperson and he was eager to study the Word of God with Zwingli. Their meetings were called prophecy meetings. They studied the New Testament in Greek. And this study led them to understand that baptism was never intended for infants, but baptism was intended for believers only. Now, often when I am meeting in the classroom with my students, I break the classroom up into different groups. I have them open their Bibles and look for scriptures that support the uh, concept of believers' baptism. Of course, we're not meeting in a classroom, and so let me share with you just a few of the scriptures that I have come up with that support uh, believers' baptism. First is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We know this as the Great Commission. And Jesus, just before his ascension, gathers his followers and says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right, Jesus instructs his uh, disciples to make disciples and then baptize them. Can an infant be a disciple? Certainly not. And so uh, infants are not candidates for baptism. The next scripture that comes to my mind comes from the experience in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost when uh, the Apostle Peter and the other disciples are preaching to the people in Jerusalem. And when they hear the gospel message and when the people hear about Jesus Christ and his death on the cross on their behalf, they cry out, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, can an infant repent? Not at all. Uh, so again, we see that uh, an infant is not a candidate for baptism. I'm going to turn uh, to another chapter in Acts, Acts chapter 16, to the story of Paul and Silas in Philippi. You know the story, how Paul and Silas were arrested and put in prison. Uh, they were singing hymns uh, and praising God in spite of their suffering. Uh, 
uh, God sent an earthquake that, uh, that, that uh, tore asunder their chains, not only Paul and Silas's, but other prisoners. The jailer, fearing that he had lost his prisoners and therefore would lose his life, he started to kill himself, but Paul cried out, don't harm yourself, we are all here. Amazed by the work of God, the jailer came to Paul and Silas and asked them the most important question of all. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And here's the answer that Paul and Silas gave in Acts 16, 31. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they, Paul and Silas, spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. He took them that very hour of the night, washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. Now, those who support the concept of infant baptism point to this story and say, surely uh, there were infants in this household. Well, surely not, because we see from the scripture that Paul and Silas spoke the word of the Lord to all in the house. And those who heard the word were the ones who were baptized. So unless we envision Paul and Silas carrying around an infant and preaching to that infant, the word of the Lord, then we cannot imagine that infants were part of those who were baptized. So there is no record of infant baptism anywhere in the New Testament. And so these Swiss brethren, Zwingli students, came to this conclusion along with their teacher, Ulrich Zwingli uh, himself. But when they approached the city council with their idea about rejecting infant baptism, well, this reform was rejected by the council and therefore Zwingli backed away from the concept of believer's baptism. Now we need to understand why infant baptism was so critical to uh, the, uh, the state at this time because we've already seen that Luther maintained infant baptism. We see again that Zwingli is holding on to infant baptism because of the city council. When there is a union of church and state, the baptism of infants not only places them on the role of the church, but it places them on the role of citizenship. And therefore, uh, because uh, citizenship is tied to obligations to support the state financially, as well as with their military service, to withhold uh, a child from infant baptism is to withhold that child from citizenship in the state and uh, the civic responsibilities of that child when he or she grows up to be an adult. All right, and so we're going to see uh, throughout this study of the Reformation that infant baptism is held on to tightly by those who are in control. So uh, Zwingli attempted to suppress the Swiss Brethren at a public disputation on baptism dated January 1525. Now, at this disputation, Zwingli had no scriptures to cite in support of infant baptism, and therefore uh, he did not use scripture, instead he used insults, and he coined this term that we translate as Anabaptist, Vider Taufer, to rebaptize or baptize again. And so this was an insult to his students to call them Anabaptists. The decision was already made. 
even though the Swiss brethren had scriptures to support their view, they were uh, rejected. The decision was that the brethren were to stop their meetings and they must have their children baptized or they would be exiled within eight days. In response, the brethren defied Zwingli and the council. They continued their secret meetings and in fact they were baptized as believers. As a result of this, they were hunted down by Zwingli and the council. They were persecuted. They were imprisoned. Ultimately, uh, many were executed. I refer to this as the brutal betrayal of Ulrich Zwingli. And I'm reminded of a favorite comic uh, titled The Brutal Betrayal of Ben Grimm. Surely by now you realize that I am a great fan of Marvel Comics. After all, I have Spider-Man right behind me and I have the Avengers overhead. And uh, I have uh, in my possession a classic uh, edition of Fantastic Four number 41, The Brutal Betrayal of Ben Grimm. All right, surely you know by now about the group Fantastic Four. Sadly, we haven't had a really good movie uh, about the Fantastic Four. We have yet to see them uh, enter the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, but uh, the Fantastic Four were the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lead comic title for the, uh, for the Marvel Comics, the flagship title, and all of their best stories came out of the Fantastic Four. This particular story is the middle issue of a six-part story arc, uh, the earliest, longest story arc in Marvel comic history, although, of course, later on, uh, they had many arcs that were longer and more complicated. But uh, in this story, uh, the Frightful Four defeated the Fantastic Four and actually robbed them of all of their powers. And then they were attacked by none other than Dr. Doom himself. Uh, during this time, Ben Grimm reverted from his, uh, his shape as the very powerful thing with his rock-hard skin, and he returned to uh, the normal human Ben Grimm. But in order to defeat uh, Dr. Doom, Reed Richards, the scientist of the group, had to come up with an invention that would restore all their powers. And in the end, he had to restore his friend, Ben, to the form of the thing. Well, the thing uh, defeated Dr. Doom, uh, but uh, he turned against his friends and actually joined up with the Frightful Four in opposition to his friends. Don't worry, uh, in the end, he comes to his senses and returns to the great uh, uh, superhero team, the Fantastic Four. But this uh, this title of this uh, of this issue, the brutal betrayal of Ben Grimm, reminds me of what Zwingli did. He brutally betrayed his friends, the Swiss Brethren, uh, Conrad Grable, Felix Mons, George Blaurock, and the others. Uh, he turned against them. He joined with the city council in persecuting them, hunting them down, imprisoning them, torturing them, and even executing them. We'll tell more of this story in our next lecture when we get to the story of the Anabaptist. But for now, let's return our attention to uh, Ulrich Zwingli.
we're going to look at a series of doctrines and practices supported by Zwingli. First, we'll start about his attitude on the union of church and state. Uh, we've seen that uh, the Reformation in Zurich was a state-sponsored church. The Reformation depended on support from the city council. And without any further dissension from his followers, whom he had either expelled, uh, imprisoned, or executed, Zwingli was the leading religious voice on the council. Zwingli emphasized the Old Testament pattern of Israel as a theocracy, and so he insisted on and encouraged and established the rule of God over the city of Zurich. He expanded this union of church and state beyond the borders of Zurich uh, to create a Christian civic union uh, in an alliance with other Swiss cantons. He wanted to spread the Reformation ideals, and then he wanted to oppose those cantons who remained loyal to the Catholic Church. Zwingli abandoned his earlier pacifism to encourage military threats against Catholic cantons. All right. As we have already stated, Zwingli adhered to infant baptism. Now, unlike Augustine, he taught that infants are not guilty of Adam's sin. And he believed that baptism is not necessary for salvation. He said that the infant was elect being born into a covenant community. But he used the Old Testament to show that baptism is the New Testament parallel to circumcision. Just as circumcision was practiced in Israel on infants to demonstrate the covenant relationship of Israel to God, in the same way infant baptism was practiced in the church to demonstrate the church's covenant with God. And so he used the Old Testament to support the idea of infant baptism. Now, on the Lord's Supper, Finally, in Easter of 1525, Zwingli observed an evangelical Lord's Supper, uh, a more simple uh, rite than the Latin formal uh, liturgical mass. Now, here is kind of uh, the end of the story of the conflict with the city council. And here I think Zwingli was wise. Uh, he waited until the city council could uh, understand and support the idea of the evangelical Lord's Supper. So it was only about a year and a half after that October 1523 disputation when he was able to accomplish what was his goal all along. Zwingli believed that the Lord's Supper was a symbolic uh, event. He taught that the bread and cup were signs or symbols to be observed in remembrance and thanksgiving for Christ's sacrifice. As you can see, uh, his view is very similar to the Baptist view. Zwingli interpreted Christ's institution of the Lord's Supper that when Jesus said uh, this uh, a bread is my body, this cup is my blood, that this bread signifies my body, this cup signifies my blood. He disagreed with Luther or the Catholics that Christ is actually present in the elements of the supper. Zwingli's writings, and you will want to remember these titles and their uh, topics. In his treatise on baptism, anabaptism, and infant baptism, he taught that baptism 
is the sign of the covenant, as we just stated. The Old Testament is the precedent for the covenant community in Zurich. He wrote a commentary on true and false religion where he explained that the Lord's Supper is a symbolic remembrance. And then his treatise on human and divine justice defends the union of church and state. Now, we've already discussed the Marburg Colloquy, where Zwingli met with Luther to discuss a possible alliance against the Catholics. They agreed on 14 points, but they could not agree on the Lord's Supper. Zwingli, as we have just said, uh, insisted that the supper was a memorial. Luther insisted uh, that it was the real presence. You see in this illustration that uh, Luther is, uh, has uh, carved into the table uh, the statement, um, hoc est corpum meum, this is my body. And he drew a circle and said, this is where I am. And he pointed, and uh, are you there with me? And of course, Zwingli said no, so they could not agree. Well, Luther and Zwingli were very different, not only on the Lord's Supper, but they had very different approaches to their reformations. Martin Luther's uh, reform was motivated by his personal sensitivity to sin and his fear of God's justice. Uh, he discovered the biblical doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone. And so he elevated scripture as the supreme authority in the church. Ulrich Zwingli, on the other hand, uh, had really uh, no sense of uh, sensitivity to sin. Obviously, he was living a very licentious life, but he was very influenced by the philosophical concept of humanism and his study of the Bible. He was opposed to Catholic practices such as fasting during Lent, clerical celibacy, papacy and papal abuses, uh, worship practices, and so his Reformation was less personal, more ecclesiastical. He was more focused on the need to change the church. And so a very different approaches to Reformation. Now, uh, the Protestant cantons ended up going to war with the Catholic cantons. Uh, and there were two wars, the first and second uh, Koppel War. And during the second war, Protestants attempted to blockade uh, routes to the Catholic cantons, hoping to uh, lay siege to them and to starve them and uh, bring them into submission. But the Protestant cantons were really unable to unite with each other, although the, can the Catholic cantons were united in defense of their own life and liberty. And so the Catholics attacked Zurich, the Catholics won, they routed the Zurich army, and uh, Zwingli, although he had been a pacifist, Earlier in his ministry, he went with uh, his army and fought with them and died on the battlefield. Uh, reportedly, his last words, they can kill the body, but not the soul. The illustration for this slide is a picture that I took in Zurich uh, that shows Ulrich Zwingli with a sword. All right. Probably the intention here is to communicate that Zwingli wielded the sword of the Lord, which is the word of truth. But nonetheless, he also wielded a literal sword on the battlefield. Before we conclude our discussion of Ulrich Zwingli, his life and ministry. Let's uh, discuss his contribution to the 
reformed churches uh, of Switzerland and beyond. We often associate reformed theology with John Calvin, its most famous advocate. But in reality, Zwingli was the founder of the reformed branch of the Reformation. He is the one who set out the goals and an early model for reformed churches. He sought to reform all areas of life in civil society, not just the doctrines and practices of the church, but he wanted uh, evangelicalism uh, to be a, uh, a guiding force in all of society. He followed only the explicit teachings of scripture. He simplified worship liturgy and he eliminated medieval Catholic elements. Biblical lessons became the focus of worship. Worship attendance was mandatory. Don't you wish you could make worship attendance mandatory? Perhaps not, because remember, faith cannot be coerced. Music and organs uh, were removed from churches. Now this is interesting because we read in the Psalms about instruments being used to guide worship. The Psalms themselves are songs of praise uh, to God. But Zwingli did not see instruments in New Testament worship, and therefore he rejected their use in his churches. Ironic because he was gifted in uh, the performance of many different uh, instruments. Of course, images were removed from the churches. And notice that uh, biblical lessons became the focus of worship so that the altar for the mass was removed from the central focus of the church and the pulpit became the central focus. This was true uh, in, uh, in Lutheranism and also in the uh, Reformed movement in Switzerland. Zwingli worked with the civil magistrates whom he considered to be the representatives of the people and the governors of the church. There was a partnership between the clergy and the laity. We'll see this again in Calvin's Geneva. He asserted a tight control on moral behavior. He and the city council set a curfew. Religious uniformity was strictly enforced and deviation was considered treasonous. Anabaptists were targeted especially. Again, we'll talk more about the Anabaptists in our next lesson. Zwingli created a disciplined people of God governed by biblical principles uh, that required extensive reform of doctrine, worship, church government, and the entire society. Laws enforcing the state church's worship were based on the precedent of Israel and Old Testament laws on religion and civil matters. Infant baptism like Old Testament circumcision included children in the covenant community. All right, I seem to be repeating myself here, but uh, this is because you will want to remember at least two or three of Zwingli's contributions to the Reformed churches. Let's look beyond the Reformed church and look at his contributions to the church as a whole. Zwingli's Reformation began independently of Luther. All right, so Zwingli obviously knew Luther. Uh, they knew each other and read each other's works, but Zwingli's Reformation was in no way dependent upon Luther. Zwingli's Reformation grew out of his personal study of the Bible, and Zwingli introduced biblical reforms to Switzerland expanding the Reformation 
beyond Germany. Zwingli will influence uh, Calvin. Uh, they, of course, will not cross paths since uh, Zwingli died before Calvin came to Switzerland, but his influence is still there upon Calvin and upon Reformed theology. Zwingli unintentionally inspired the free church movement through his followers who became the Anabaptists. Now, we've talked at length about how Zwingli depended upon a scripture and he warned the city council not to be at odds with the word of God because it will persist. It can be dammed up for a while, but is impossible to stop. However, Zwingli uh, put himself at odds with the teachings of the Word of God on baptism. He and his students studied the New Testament. They came to the correct conclusion that biblical baptism was intended for believers and not for infants. And yet Zwingli, when confronted by resistance from the Zurich City Council, he opposed the biblical doctrine of believers' baptism. Through persecution and martyrdom of the Anabaptists, Zwingli and the Zurich City Council attempted to dam up believers' baptism, but it was impossible to stop the Word of God from going forth through the evangelism of the Anabaptists throughout Europe and the work of Baptists in England, America, and around the world. So, we uh, regret Zwingli's lapse of judgment and his departure from his own uh, principles of following scripture. But nonetheless, Zwingli's words ring true to us. For God's sake, we must not put ourselves at odds with the word of God. We are under obligation to preach it and teach it no matter the opposition from the world or even from the church. And so, for all the good that Zwingli did, we admire him. For the uh, hindrance that he placed before the full gospel, before the uh, completion of his reformation, well, we, uh, we then want to appreciate those who followed through with the biblical principles, and that is his students, uh, his successors, the Anabaptists. Again, we'll talk about them later. Thanks for your attention uh, through our study of Ulrich Zwingli and the Swiss Reformation. But wait, there's more. I wanted to tell you about a little film clip uh, called uh, The Overview of the Reformation. This is a one episode, The Swiss Reformation. It talks about Zwingli and Calvin. It's got, uh, it's about a 30 minute clip on Ulrich Zwingli and John Calvin and you can find it on uh, YouTube for free. All right, so I just wanted to recommend that before I finally let you go. All right. Bye-bye for now.